The Cosmic Highway. God's Word for Today and Beyond. Truths you might not have heard before. Truths that might be considered as fringe, controversial, blurry, or just unbelievable. This is the Unfiltered Biblical. Hello and welcome to the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for Today and Beyond. I am Dr. S.W. Kibler here at Dr. S.W. Kibler Ministries. Please remember to like and follow the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for Today and Beyond. And thank you so much to those who support this ministry financially and through prayer. At the end of this video, there is a screen that provides information on how to support us. Hello and welcome to the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for today and beyond. I am Dr. S.W. Kibler here at Dr. S.W. Kibler Ministries and this is a series, Eternity from There and Back Again, God's Plan Through the Ages, a Supernatural Conflict. This is part two of a previous video that uh, I had done on Easter is Not Passover. And uh, there's some more information that I want to uh, uh, share with you about this because I think this is vitally important. I think it's important for us to understand. And I know I get criticized for uh, harping on this, but I, I really, really believe that if we do not, as true believing Christians, grasp what is happening with us, in the way that we say we worship the Lord, I think we need to pay attention to this. So here we go. Here is a uh, three important questions that I have for you. And yes, today I am joined by Gretel. So here she is. So I have three important questions for, for you. And the first is, is tradition or truth more important to you? Is tradition or truth more important? The second question is, if you learn the truth, should you then adjust your beliefs to reflect that truth? So if you learn the truth, should you then change and reflect the truth that you have learned? The third question is, if you know the truth and you don't adjust your beliefs or yourself to reflect that truth, is that a form of rejecting? Is that a form of rejecting the truth? So I ask these questions because it seems to me that there are many who consider themselves as Christians and are more concerned about keeping religious tradition rather than seeking the truth of the biblical text. As well, most Christians are more concerned with having their personal beliefs validated rather than changing their beliefs to reflect the truth of the biblical text. I say all that to say this. There is much of Christendom that is based upon tradition rather than truth, even to the point that tradition overshadows and obscures the truth. Easter is one of these traditions. So let this be a warning. Uh, you are about to enter the faith shake zone, which might cause a crisis of faith. That is, what you might have believed at this point may not be as biblical as you once thought. So here is a statement, and it is, Easter is not the same as Passover. And the Easter traditions are not based upon the biblical text and they are not given as acceptable worship of Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. We read this verse on numerous occasions, but we're going to read it again. And this is Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 31. We read, when the Lord your God cuts off 
before you the nations whom you go into dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land. Take care that you are not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods, that I may do the same? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. So these are the words spoken in Deuteronomy 12, verses 29 through 31, that the Lord spoke directly through Moses to the children of Israel before they entered the promised land. In the book of Exodus, they were given the law of Moses, the laws of worship, of sacrifice and offerings, how they were to approach God, Yahweh Elohim. And now, the Lord God is telling them to not use or incorporate their traditions and the rituals that are used to worship other gods and say they're worshiping him. He said, don't do that. Don't use these other rituals and traditions to worship me. I find it abominable. Right? Right? He, he does not... He does not want us to do that. They're an abominable thing before the Lord. The Lord God said those rituals and traditions uh, involve everything that is abominable to the Lord. The Lord God hates these things. It's important for us to realize that how we worship Creator God, Yahweh Elohim, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is not to be made up by us. We don't decide what we are going to do to worship the Lord. That's what Cain did. In the book of Genesis, Cain decided what he was going to do instead of doing what the Lord had said for him to do. So, it's important that we realize we do not make it up. By ourselves we don't decide and we don't confiscate the worship the rituals the traditions of other gods and then say we're gonna do that and but we're gonna say we're worshiping the Lord God Yahweh Elohim you don't take from worshiping other gods what they do and they say we're gonna do the same thing we're just going to say we're gonna worship Jesus or we're gonna worship the Lord by doing these things. The Lord has made it clear, don't do that. You will remember, also, this is exactly what happened at the foot of Mount Sinai when they made the golden calf, and they said, this is your God, Yahweh, and they offered sacrifices and offerings to the golden calf, and the Lord did not like it, and he wanted to kill the entire multitude of the children of Israel. But Moses pleaded for them. Uh, and when Moses went down, he saw the clamor and what they had done. And he said, whoever is on the Lord's side, let him come to me. And it was only the, the descendants of Levi who came to Moses. And he says, now, strap a sword on your side and go back to and throw through the congregation and kill as many men as you can. And that day, 3,000 souls were killed. So we have an understanding of what the Lord does not like. Don't take something that's a worship of another God and use it and say you're worshiping Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Don't do it. It's we have multiple, multiple verses in the Bible that has shown that. So, tradition has replaced truth. Easter is not Passover. We know from the biblical text that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, was crucified on Passover and resurrected to life on the first day of the week after three days and nights in the tomb. We find that in Matthew chapter 27 through 28, Luke 
chapters 23 through 24, Mark chapters 15 through 16, and the Gospel of John chapters 19 through 20. It's documented when Christ died and when he resurrected. It was on a specific date, in a specific day of a feast that the Lord had implemented. If Easter is a celebration of the resurrection of Yeshua, then why does Easter occur on a different date than Passover? In fact, this year, 2024, Easter falls on March 31st and Passover falls on April 21. The truth-seeking Christian might stop and think, hmm, why is that? Why is Easter that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ not during the God-given biblical feast of Passover when Christ was actually crucified and on the third day rose again? Interestingly, the two are not the same at all. In fact, Easter... And all of its traditions and rituals that we see today was practiced 2,000 years before the birth of Yeshua. And it wasn't part of worship of the Lord God. It was worship of another God. Actually, a goddess. And two other gods, namely Ra and Tammuz, or Mithras. Now, I want to remind you about Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, and their other names, and the gods by which they were known. We see Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Okay. We'll try to we'll clear this up a little bit clearer in just a minute, but here we go. Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. In Babylon, Nimrod was known as Belus. In Egypt, as Ra. Assyria, as Linus. In Lebanon, as Baal. Phoenicians, as El. Greece, as Zeus. Rome, as Jupiter. The Nordic religions, as Odin. The Hindu religions, as Vishnu. The Luciferian, as Lucifer himself. And the Catholic religion, as God the Father. Semiramis. Semiramis. Nimrod's wife. In Babylon was known as Easter. I know you can see it on this chart. It's spelled I-S-H-T-A-R, but it's pronounced Easter. Egypt as Isis, Assyria as Beltus, Lebanon as Ashtoreth, by the Phoenicians as Astarte, in Greece Aphrodite, Rome Diana, the Nordic religions as Joro, Hindu as Chandra, Luciferian as Diana in the Catholic religion as Mary. Tammuz, the offspring of Nimrod and Semiramis, was known as Tammuz in Babylon, as Horus in Egypt, as Hercules in Assyria, as Tammuz again in Lebanon, as Bacchus in, by the Phoenicians, as uh, Dionysus in Greece, Apollo in Rome, Thor in the Nordic religion, Krishna in the Hindu religions, the Antichrist by the Luciferian belief, and then the Catholics as Jesus. So I want you to see the relationship of these other nations and who Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz were said to be in these other nations because we will read about Baal in the biblical text. We'll read about uh, Ashtoreth, Astarte, Diana in the biblical text. So it's really important that we see that what we have is a, a pantheon of gods that originated from a specific place and that is at the Tower of Babel. Now, this is a detailed origin. Okay, Nimrod, who had a grandson, Nimrod was the grandson of one of Noah's sons named Ham. Ham had a son named Nimrod, uh, named Cush. Cush, who married a woman named Semiramis. 
So Nimrod was a grandson of one of Noah's sons. Okay, so Ham had a son named Cush who married a woman named Samarimus. Cush and Samarimus then had a son and named him Nimrod. After the death of his father, Nimrod married his own mother. Nimrod married his own mother, Samarimus, and became a powerful king. We read about Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. We read this, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter in the face of Yahweh, which means in the face of, confrontive, combative to Yahweh. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, in the face or confrontive to Yahweh. In the beginning of his kingdom, Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, in Erech, and Akkad, in Kalne, in the land of Shinar. Nimrod became a god man to the people, and Samarimus' wife and mother <laughs> became the powerful queen of ancient Babylon. Nimrod was eventually killed by an enemy, and his body was cut into pieces and sent out to various parts of the kingdom. And Samarimus then had all the parts regathered except for one part they couldn't find. That was his reproductive organ. But Samarimus claimed that Nimrod could not come back to life without it and told the people of Babylon that Nimrod now had ascended to the sun and was now to be called Baal, B-A-A-L, Baal also known as Ra, the sun god. Queen Samarimus also proclaimed that Baal would be present on earth in the form of a flame, whether a candle or a lamp, when used in the worship. Samarimus was creating what is known as the Babylonian mystery religion. And with the help of Satan, she set herself up as a goddess. Samarimus claimed to be immaculately conceived she taught that she was a moon goddess, right? The moon that goes through 28-day cycles, right? But when the moon went through the 28 days of that cycle, it ovulated when it was full. And then she claims she came down in an egg from the moon, a giant egg that fell into the Euphrates River, and she emerged as Easter. Easter. That was her name. She emerged as Easter. Easter Sunday was a feast day that commemorated the resurrection of one of their other gods. It was her day, Easter Sunday. This is what was practiced 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus. Easter Sunday was practiced 2,000 years before Jesus. And it's not about Yeshua is not about the Lord God. It's about Easter, this goddess, this moon goddess, also known as Samarimus, and her immaculately conceived son, Tammuz, who was immaculately conceived from Baal. Baal in Easter, or Baal in Samarimus, when Baal was the sun god, he impregnated E immaculately <laughs> Samarimus and she gave forth her firstborn son known as Tammuz that's why I wanted to show you these, the list of these gods so Easter Sunday was celebrated before the birth of Christ and had nothing to do with Yeshua had nothing to do with his death, burial or resurrection. And er, early believers did not participate in Easter Sunday because it was a pagan celebration and not about Yeshua at all. However, in 325 AD, an emperor by the name of Constantine, who also proclaimed himself as Pope of the church he started and called it the universal church or the catholic church he got together an ecumenical council and called and they met in Nicaea and it's called the council of Nicaea it's where we get the Nicene Creed by the way but the council of Nicaea 
And there, at that council, it was decided to not observe Passover as the celebration of the resurrection of Yeshua. Listen, at the Council of Nicaea, it was there, it was decided to not, to not celebrate the resurrection of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ, on Passover, or that, that feast. And a letter was written to those who were unable or did not attend that council. And here is the uh, translation of that letter. It was declared to be particularly unworthy for this, the holiest of all festivals, to follow the custom, that is the calculation, of the Jews who had soiled their hands with the most fearful of crimes and whose minds were blinded. In rejecting their custom, we may transmit to our descendants legitimate mode of celebrating Easter. We ought not, therefore, to have anything in common with the Jews, for the Savior has shown us another way. We desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews. There it is, the letter of the emperor to all those not present at the council, Suibus, <clears throat> Vita Constantine. Okay. Therefore, Easter, a celebration of the goddess, queen of heaven, also known as Semiramis, was set as the day to celebrate the resurrection of Yeshua of Jesus Christ. And it was a decision also based on anti-Semitism. It was an anti-Semitic decision. They found the Jews detestable. That's the history, folks. Easter Sunday <clears throat> is a pagan holiday for the goddess Easter, also known as Diana, also known as Astarte, also known as Asherah, also known originally as Semiramis, also known as the Queen of Heaven. And her conceived son, after Ra had impregnated her, the god Ra, the sun god Ra, Tammuz. I know. It sounds silly, but that is the historical facts of how Easter Sunday came to be. So Easter Sunday always falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Easter Sunday always falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. That is from antiquity, from before the birth of Christ. That's when it fell. And guess when it's celebrated today? Exactly the same. The first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Passover. Passover has a specific date that the Lord gave when it should occur. The Lord, God, instituted the Feast of Passover himself. And he instituted it to be observed at a specific date, within dates. And it always is to fall on the 14th day of Nisan, according to the biblical text. Let's see if I have that. Let's see. I should have had a couple of those. Okay, here we go. This is Leviticus chapter 23, verses 4 through 8. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. When are you to celebrate them? At the time they are appointed. They have an appointed time. In the first month, Nathan, on the 14th day of the month, that twilight, is the Lord's 
Passover. That's it. On the 14th day of the first month, Nisan, is the Passover. On the 15th day of the same month begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we read about that taking place throughout the Old Testament and surely in the New Testament, in the Gospels. So, oh yes, here we go. So here is our... Um, uh, the slides that show uh, these are the years this is a common era it starts with 2000 because that's what I could find in the date that Easter falls on in the date that Passover falls on now remember this that that if if Easter is celebrated on a different day than Passover and the church counts 50 days from Easter to say, uh, it's the Christian Pentecost. You know that it's going to be off because the Feast of Pentecost or Shabbat, right, is another feast that falls at a specific day on a specific month. Actually, it's forty-nine days plus one after the first day of Passover. So, if Easter is on a different date, then the Christian Pentecost is going to be on a different date. So here we have from 2000 all the way through. You can see here's April 23rd for the Easter date and April 18th for Passover in 2021. April 15th compared to the 6th of April. 31 of March or March 26th. Here, look at this one. Here's 2005. March 27 for Easter and April 22nd for Passover. Look at this one, 2008, March 23rd for Easter and Passover, actually on April the 18th. Let's, whoops. <laughs> if you look down, uh, this is this year, March 31, here, and Passover is actually on April 21. So there are, these different dates that we the there's a, a difference between the date of Easter and the date of Passover that may be nearly a month apart because Easter the worship of the goddess Easter always falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox but the god given biblical feast of Passover always and only occurs on the 14th day of Nisan. It's the only time it ever occurs. 14th day of Nisan. Because that is when the Lord said it was to occur. Because he instituted them. That is when Yeshua was crucified and then followed by his burial and resurrection and has nothing to do with Easter Sunday has nothing to do with Easter Sunday. It has everything to do with the Lord God fulfilling his word on the day that he said he would fulfill it. So, uh, here are the, uh, the, the prophecies in the, the seven feasts that the Lord God himself implemented and said, these are the dates on the 14th of Nisan is to be the Passover. The following day, unleavened bread. And then on the 17th is first fruits. Then, after 49 weeks, plus, uh, I'm sorry, 40, 49 uh, days plus one day uh, would be Pentecost. And then we go into the fall uh, feast of trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. But you see here, there were specific dates. These are coming from the Lord God himself. And as we looked in the previous videos on the seven biblical feasts, that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, fulfilled the prophecies concerning the Messiah in the seven biblical feasts of Israel. 
and he will again completely, 100% fulfill them upon his return. But this one specific Passover, he can only die once and raise from the dead once, and it was on the appointed time that it happened, according to the Lord God's timetable, not man's, the Lord God's timetable. The Lord God did not change the date of the fulfillment of his word. But man did. Man changed the date. And churches around the world follow a man-made date rather than the Lord God's date that he implemented. Why is that? Well, Constantine and the Council of Nicaea decided that the Lord's timing was not that important and that the Lord God fulfilling his word was not that important. But what was important was to rename the event of the resurrection of Yeshua after a goddess and incorporate the rituals and traditions of Easter worship into Christendom. That's historical, folks. That is the history. More than that, here are the uh, customs and traditions in uh, Easter Sunday. The Easter egg is what it was called 2,000 years before Christ. The Easter egg was used to recognize Easter's descent from the moon in a large egg that landed in the Euphrates River. Children that had been sacrificed to Bel or Moloch, their blood was used to color the eggs. They were red eggs. That's where it originated, the colored eggs. The eggs were then hidden, and the living children would hunt for them in resemblance to Nimrod, the mighty hunter. The blood-stained eggs later on, were also marked with a T for Tammuz. People think that was a cross on the colored egg that you can see in some religious traditions, Christian traditions. They'll have red eggs with a cross. It's not a cross. It's a T for Tammuz. It's the same as the hot cross buns during the Christmas time were buns made for Tammuz and marked with the towel. Or a T. Also, since Tammuz was killed, the, the son was killed by a wild boar, worshippers were to eat pork on Easter Sunday. That's the tradition. That's where it comes from. Forty days before Easter Sunday, the people were to lament the death of Tammuz, although he was resurrected from the dead. But they were to lament the death of Tammuz for 40 days. And that is the origination of what Christians call Lent. <clears throat> Easter uh, Sunday started off with a sunrise service to acknowledge the rising of the sun. That is Ra, Baal. And that he will return. The hare, the Easter bunny, that was Easter, the goddess, her symbol. So, not only was the date of the remembrance of the resurrection of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, changed from the God-given date, the Passover, and then the third day on his resurrection. It was changed to that of the day of worship for a goddess, Easter, and the other gods, Ra and Tammuz. And the rituals and the traditions that are so common today, those were incorporated from this worship of these other gods. And today, now it said, this is how we recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ by incorporating 
this false god, pagan god worship on the day named after another god and using the same traditions and rituals for that goddess worship is now incorporated into Christian worship and we say, oh, we're doing it for Jesus. Therefore, how other gods and goddesses were worshipped, they're incorporated into Christian worship today and how Yeshua is worshipped. I know, Christians say, but I'm not thinking about these other gods on Easter. And when I do all those things, you know, I do all these things that everyone else does on Easter, but I'm not thinking about these other gods. I think about Jesus. Well, it might not matter to you. And you may be stuck in your tradition and making all the excuses that you can think of, but it does matter to the Lord God. And we, today, Christendom, are doing exactly what he told his people not to do. Remember, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. When the Lord God cuts off before you the nations of whom you go into dispossess, you do dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care you not be ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their God, saying, How did these nations serve their gods that I also may do the same? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. Quote, unquote, from God, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim himself. Now, I want us to look at a couple of other verses. This is Jeremiah 7, 18 through 19. The children gather wood, the fires kindle the fire, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough and make cakes to the queen of heaven, Samarimus, Easter, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says Yahweh? Do they not promote, provoke themselves to the confusion of of their own faces. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, your Elohim, your God, behold, my anger and all my fury shall be poured out upon this place. What does the Lord God think about incorporating the worship of other gods? It doesn't make him happy, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. And here is Ezekiel. This is chapter 8, verses 14 through 15. And he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Right? They were to weep 40 days before Easter Sunday for Tammuz. They're doing this at the house of the Lord, the north gate. They're doing that at the house of the Lord. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? You will see still greater abominations than these. Well, I believe Christendom today is that greater abomination. I believe that Christianity today is that greater abomination that the Lord God spoke to Ezekiel about. I believe this is one of the most important truths, and again, why I'm doing the second video on this. Because we need to recognize that our nation is under judgment. Not that it's going to be under, it is. We are under the judgment of the Lord. And we need to know at least why. And this is one of the reasons. Christians today ask the Lord to bless us. God bless America. Yet, we are a nation and Christians that are in rebellion to the Lord because we have incorporated these rituals and traditions of worshiping other gods 
and we have brought them into the house of the Lord, and we practice them in his presence, and then think he needs to accept that from us as worship. When he says, that is abominable in everything I hate. We have incorporated these rituals and traditions used for other gods. We've brought them into Christian worship and brought them to the house of God. How can we ask the Lord to bless us? We should ask the Lord to have mercy upon us because we have deviated so far away from him and his word. We do all these traditions and these rituals, and it makes us feel good about what we're doing. But all along, the Lord is saying, that is abominable and I hate it. But we still do it. We need to ask the Lord to have mercy on us. You see, we, there are many who want America to be great again. And the Lord is looking at his people and saying, where'd you go? What are you doing? That's why in the book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea, the church of the end times, it's Jesus on the outside, knocking on the door, wanting in to the church because he has been replaced by the worship and traditions used to worship other gods. He's on the outside and that is why the Lord God spits them out of his mouth. We need today to understand we are under judgment. And this is why we, as his children, have deviated so far from what he said. And we are doing exactly those things that he said not to do. You can feel good about that if you want, and you can make all the excuses that you want. But we are to please the Lord, not please ourselves, and not please. Man, we should ask the Lord to have mercy on us. Remember, know the truth, stand on the truth, and speak the truth. And be where God can bless you. Dr. S.W. Kibler Ministries and The Cosmic Bible, God's Word for Today and Beyond, we strive to provide in-depth teaching on the fundamental message of the biblical text. I believe the truth of the biblical text is more important than any church or denominational tradition. If you feel this is what you want and need and wish to support this effort, please support this ministry financially and prayerfully. Please make checks payable to Dr. S. W. Kibler Ministries, P.O. Box 667, Wilcox, Arizona, 85644. And remember, know the truth, stand on the truth, and speak the truth. And our prayer is that God will bless you.